Yeah, but with a child who's sort of closer to distance two, you might be able to play games with them and teach them full and empty. And then for that first wake up at night, even if they're, you know, if they're sleeping with you, you can still do this and say, boobies empty, just have a cuddle. Yeah, yeah. Until they fill up, you know, and boobies will get full again. Yeah. And they might get a little bit, you know, pooped off with you. But over a period of a few days, they'll, okay, boobies are empty. And you do have to offer, you know, later on, the next time they wake up, you do have to offer the boobs so that they trust you. And then you yeah. can gradually stretch it to, you know, the second time they wake up. Oh, God, and I that's wish that's quite I a gentle. I totally wish I'd known all these little things when I was mm. weaning Leroy. <laughs> that nurses in the hard. daytime and... Yeah full and empty and little games and dialogue about all of that. That just would have been so, so helpful. Yeah. But, but we learn with each kid, you know, we learn, we learn things as they grow, don't we? And then we can, you know, share it with other women and. Absolutely. Absolutely. that off. Goodness me. <laughs> oh, it's your phone. That's what it was. I can't see how to, how do I turn it off? Oh, well, never mind. I'll leave it. It can just buzz off. I'll let it buzz for a bit, bit and I'll get that producer to just edit this bit out. We'll just wait for it to finish. Someone wants you. Right, stop now. Yeah. Wait Good. for that reception to come back. Um, a beautiful mum of ours, Anwen, would also love to hear your take on if and when to try and introduce pumping and bottles, especially this idea now that we have around dads doing the overnight feeds. So often she says she sees this expectation without an understanding of milk supply being highest and risk of bottle preferences. Is there any place for bottles and pumping and dads doing night feeds? Dads can do baby massage. They can bath or shower with the baby. They can lie with the baby skin to skin and watch the rugby if they want to. You know, there's so many ways dads can bond without having to impact that breastfeeding relationship. And the night feeds, I mean, if you do want to pump and you do want to give your partner a bottle and go to bed at 9 or 10, you still have to express then so that your baby gets that night milk. No, oh, it's cut out. And so that you maintain your dad to do a night feed overnight. Hang on, pause while you do the phone. Keep the doing screen to turn it off, to reject. I don't know how. I think you could... But I can't get it up for some reason. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's all right. What is it? I don't know. It's gone. You... It's gone. Hopefully that'll call back. Yeah, so there's so many beautiful things that dads can do. What were you saying after that? Like watch the rugby. There's lots of other ways to not watch interrupt that breastfeeding. Can, they can do all sorts of things. Oh, it's cut again. So do you want to get your phone <laughs> do you want to tell them that you're you can text them or phone them i don't mind if you want to do that mark it up three it says no caller id so don't even know oh i hate that yeah, so I'll be like, come in, Leroy. It's a good time, darling. Leroy's just come home too, so it's a good time. Don't worry, we'll just cut out that little bit. Leroy, when you want to hotspot off your phone but not get phone calls in, what do you do on your phone? Which is do not disturb. Oh, which is that one? It looks like what? Show me. Oh, it looks like a moon. That one that looks like a little moon. You know when you swipe up, that one that looks like a little moon is a do not disturb. Oh, 
Oh. And that will stop phone calls, but you can still do Bluetooth. Yeah, I still can't see it. Oh, yeah, that's cool. It says calls and notifications will be silenced while your iPhone is locked. Do you have to swipe your phone up to see that one? Yeah, yeah, swipe up from ah. the middle. And there's a little moon. Waning. Oh, here we are. I see. Got it. Done it. Oh, yeah. great. Okay, cool. So I'm so sorry. Can you go back to that bit about dads? Yeah, so there's all these great things they can do, but don't want to interrupt that breastfeeding relationship. That's where it cut off. Yes, because in the, in the beginning, when your baby's learning to breastfeed, the sucking action from a bottle is actually different from sucking at the breast. So you really need your baby to be very effectively breastfeeding before you start pumping and offering bottles and understanding that day milk and night milk are different. I know, you know, you do you, if that's what you want to do. Um, but remember you do need to pump in the evening, give your baby evening milk. If dad's going to do it, maybe you do it the night before and dad uses that milk in the evening. But I still see that it's more work for that mother that she's going to pump. I mean, maybe dad gives a bottle at nine o'clock while she's off having her shower and getting ready for bed. But I think if you just breastfeed, give your baby to your partner to settle, that works really nicely. Mm. It's not so much bonding with the bottle, it's yeah. just bonding with the baby and that's better. Yeah. Because if you're not pumping at that time, you're not emptying your breasts, your body's going to get the feedback inhibitor of lactation, which is a hormone that comes as your breasts fill, and they're going to get that message that you don't need to make milk. So your supply is going to go down. And yeah. overnight, particularly with a young baby, overnight your prolactin levels, which are your milk-making hormones, they're the highest. So breastfeeding overnight is going to really help your supply. You know, if your baby naturally sleeps longer at night, that's fine. They've probably had an evening feed. They've got their um, tryptophan. They've got their melatonin because babies don't produce their own melatonin for about four months anyway. So they've had all that evening milk, which is great. And if they choose to sleep longer, as long as your breast milk supply is good, you can go with it. It's so good. I have watched um, some of my mums over the years um, go through the weaning process or um, putting their babies into their cots and go through, I, I think it's quite a period of uh, depression and heaviness. And I think what they're missing is the oxytocin and the prolactin. It's such a dramatic hormone change. Potentially, I think women need to be aware of that as well, don't you think? Or Oh, that chemistry is so, it's so fragile, isn't it? It can really, you know, and just sitting holding and cuddling a baby, you've got oxytocin, which is helping with that anxiety. So, mm. you know, you hear all those voices about babies needing to self-settle I don't need to. You know, if we snuggle up to a partner and we're all relaxed, you know, nobody pokes you and says, get over your own side of the bed. We shouldn't be cuddling. We're creating bad habits. You know, it, it's, it's just not done. But we expect this incredible stuff from very young babies. And mm -hmm. babies, when they're first born, they enter sleep through an active sleep phase. Um, you know, it takes their little bodies time to get into a deeper sleep anyway. So, and you know what? You're not going to get cuddles for much longer. They're going to be crawling and wriggling and not snuggling in like that in some, somewhere in the next six months. Yeah. Precious. Yeah. But that chemistry, I really agree with you. That chemistry is, you know, you, you're very vulnerable when you've just had a baby and really to be able to just chill and cuddle. I say Netflix and chill. And I have my little 13 year old grandson say, Nanny, you have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Netflix and chill. Bibby Bickies and Bibby Chill. Yeah, fill a basket with stuff. You know, you've got your snacks right. there. There might be Bibby Bickies. There might be some fruit and a bottle of water and perhaps a couple of nappies and some breast pads, whatever you're going to need. And just cut that basket with you, whether it's sitting out in the sunshine or whether it's on the veranda or whether it's in, on your bed or whether it's, um, you know, watching TV. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And just sit there and chill. Yeah. I love it. Thank you. So sleep being the other big hot topic, mm -hmm. um, uh, Han Perkins is asking us, we'd love to hear any tips you have for safe bed sharing. Okay, so there is a thing called the Safe Sleep 7, which um, 
I actually mentioned him. I've got a book, Sleeping Like a Baby. So I've mentioned that in there because it was created by Diana West and co, who wrote Sweet Sleep for published by La Leche League. Um, and obviously no smoking. Um, you know, if you're a smoker, baby needs to be separate from you. And smoking during pregnancy, there's now research around that that can um, inhibit the baby's development of their arousal response. So smoking, you know, a smoke-free environment, pregnancy, and that you're sober and that your partner's sober. Because if you're on any medication or you've had any alcohol, and that's why I get, I get so upset about all these wine memes, you know, that I think they've gone overboard because... If you're a new mother, you know, okay, if you want to have an occasional drink, but it's getting really silly that mummy needs wine. And if mummy needs wine, needs it, maybe she needs some support and some counselling and some help. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that you are sober and otherwise you're not aware of your baby. Yeah. You know, if you've been drinking, you go into a deeper sleep, that baby's on their back. And if you're lying with your baby, maybe I could stand up a bit, um, and you've yeah. got that baby in the crook of your arm, you're on your side, your knees will be bent if you're breastfeeding. That's, that's the breastfeeding mother's position. The baby is honed in on the breast. You're not going to roll over your outstretched arm. They're not going to slide down below your knees. So you've got that yeah. cuddle curl. And if you watch a cat feeding their kittens, mm -hmm. if you watch any mammal, that's the position they get into. So that cuddle curl, um, that the baby's lightly dressed, um, you know, you wouldn't have a sleeping bag on if they're in your bed. You want them uncovered. You want their head uncovered. Um, and you want your bed to be fairly firm. You know, if it's too soft, the baby can get down into crevices. Um, you know, watch out for cords and gaps and things like that too. I love so it. creating a safe space mm. in your bed and that if you've got a partner in the bed with you, that you're both taking responsibility because... Mm -hmm. You know, it's no good just one person saying, um, it's fine, I'm sober, I'm, you know, you both need to be sober and aware of the baby. Yeah, I really hope that people, I think for a long time, um, well over 15, 10, no, probably 10 plus years, there's been a big period of time now where women have been very afraid to co-sleep and it's been a bit like, oh, my God, you're having a home birth. Oh, my God, you're a co-sleeper. Oh. Like they're shunned almost. But it's yeah. great to hear about these principles and it's great to also for people who are listening to listen to Dr Howard Chilton's podcast who also talks about his work and James McKenna's work in showing that, sharing a bed can be safe when certain factors are yes. considered. If you've got it safe. Yeah, James McKinn is wonderful. And so is Howard Chilton. You know, that yeah. it's something we've done forever, but I think if we don't talk about it, parents don't know how to do it safely. Yeah. And they're more likely to do it when they're absolutely exhausted and about to hit a deep sleep. They might have even had a drink or they might have taken some medication and then it's not safe. No. You know, so you do it as a last resort because you just think, oh, fuck it, I'm going to take that baby and fall asleep in bed with it. And, mm. you know, which is what I did with my first baby. I didn't kill him, but, you know, um, you know, I, I just had got up and down and up and down and up and down and, and I was told by my relatives that I would kill him because he was slept in our bed. But, um, you know, I got up and down, up and down. I actually handed him to my partner. My husband put him on his chest. Yeah. Um, as the sun was coming in, the baby wasn't in his cot. I'm throwing off the blankets to see where this baby is. And I turned around, still sound asleep on my husband's chest, skin to skin, which was really oh. beautiful. Oh, Leroy spent many a night sleeping there on his daddy's chest. I remember it. It was so beautiful. It's mm. a beautiful thing. So as long it's as we good. keep the safe environment and we're really careful about that, mm. you know, the risks aren't here. And by four months, the risks between cot and co-sleeping are no different. That's really That's great. The little no, it's great to know baby. the little bubbers. Yeah, yeah. Little bubbers. And if you've had a prem baby or something like that, you know, be a bit more careful. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, bed sharing's the best. It's so snuggly and delicious. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And Simone's asking, should your baby tell you their sleep routine or should you direct them into sleep times as they get older? And if so, what age do we start sleep training? She says she doesn't like the term, but that's what gets used. Mm. What do you reckon? Yeah. I think we can just follow the baby's leads right up. You know, I, I suppose it depends. If you have to go to work in the morning and your baby's up till midnight, maybe try, um, you know, snuggling down and turning the lights low earlier at night and gradually move that back. I had one child who only needed eight hours and any 24 at six months. Mm. So I kind of gradually moved it so that about 11 o'clock at night he would fall asleep till mm. about seven in the morning because 
and he woke up a couple of times in there for a feed anyway, but, you know, at six months, because that kid, I would put, his older brother was having an afternoon nap and I would snuggle him down with the curtains drawn and the room dark and put him on the boob pretending it was night time, but he wasn't having that. He'd have the boob and then he'd be up ready to crawl again. And he was very active and, you know, 95th percentile for weight and height and everything because I had people telling me if he doesn't sleep, he won't grow. Well, mm. he's three tall man now. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it was just, he's just one of those kids who didn't need a lot of sleep. And there are genetic factors around that now. There have been some studies showing that, you know, if you're a person or your partner's a person that's high energy, doesn't need a lot of sleep, yeah. chances are you have a child like that. So you can't really force them into sleep, but you can... And by the time they're toddlers, you can create a gentle rhythm to your day. Yeah, yeah, got it. You know, they might not be in bed by six or seven at night. There's no rules about that. But, you know, you can move them towards it. And then there'll be tricky times as they drop sleeps, you know, as they drop their naps. There'll be times mm. where they might need one one day, so they'll be up late that exactly. night. Exactly, so yeah. It's being flexible, but, you know, if you want to try and nudge it a bit to, you know, time, time adapt to, to the work, family. Yeah. yeah. It's up to the family. Yeah, that, that can be fine. Yeah, yeah. And what about tips or tricks for an easy transition um, from the co-sleep to the cot you've already talked about, but what about from a cot to a big bed, Sarah's asking? Right. You can start, I think if you're making any of these changes, again, the gradually with love things. So you could start the daytime bed, the bed in the daytime nap. You know, if your toddler's having a daytime nap, if they're happy in the cot and they haven't started to climb out, you can leave them in the cot as long as it works for you. But if you want to transition them out, um, you know, starting with the daytime nap and you may have to lie down with them. Down and with also them. buying, uh, you know, getting them a quilt cover, a doona cover that they with a character on it that they yeah. like or a colour that they like, something like that. I know watched my daughter do it with her son and he was actually in their bed. They'd taken the bed off the legs. Um, you know, it was down on the yeah on down the floor. On the floor. And he was about 17 months and he was talking really early. And she just said, I've had I'm jack of him climbing all over me in the night. And so she he had his own room and she had a mattress on the floor, bought a lamb's wool underlay, put a sheet on, gave him a pillow because he was quite safe in the daytime. Um, and a, there was a quilt cover with a dragon on that he really liked. And he just straight up went my bed, own bed, new bed, because she was going to do that over a period of a couple of weeks, but he wanted to go back in there at night time. So she put him in there thinking, oh, well, I'll still be waking up. He slept till five in the morning. Amazing. And that's what... (laughs) Third time in his whole life. (laughs) I love it. And every family does it differently. Differently, and I think it, that's what's so tricky. There isn't a blanket rule for every family. It's no. about you and the child. And I love how creativity comes into this whole process. And I've seen amazing beds, like, you know, queen-size beds side by side, yep. mattresses on the floor and a whole sleep room. Um, yep. It's whatever works in your family, really. Yep. And, and speaking of that, that big bed thing I was just going to say I have some beautiful friends in Byron and they um you know who I do it for and and they just had made so if anybody wants it they just have to go to 40 winks who are now the experts they have a double king mattress for the wow. four of them plus the two dogs and the two- <laughs> <laughs> and it's all working incredibly well. Like the full bed head's been made, the full mattress, oh, wow. the quilt, everything. It's so, so cool. So that's 40 Winks. Yeah, 40 yeah. Winks did that for them. It was really cool. Amazing. And the woman, it was so funny when the mum, my friend rang them and said, this is what I'd really like. And the woman said, you know what? That's what I would have loved like 40 years ago and I'm going to help you do it. So she got to like live oh. her dream through helping them. It was really beautiful. <laughs> beautiful because a double king, yeah, the whole family set for ages. Step forever, forever, forever. <laughs> and see that's it it's people say I, in my last course I don't get asked very often but how long is it okay for the child to sleep in the bed or how long until when should you get them out of the bed because they could stay in there forever and I'm like oh I don't, uh, like what do you, would you say to that well I used to write for a magazine in Asia and 
they'd send me copies of this magazine and there was an article about co-sleeping. I hadn't written it and they'd interviewed a psychiatrist from the Philippines and they asked her that question and she said, by, by adolescence, because adolescents need privacy. <laughs> but that is not what we'd hear over here. <laughs> Adolescents definitely that. need privacy. Yeah, adolescents need privacy. And chances are, you know, they, they won't still be snuggling up to you. No, they won't. They won't. They'll do it earlier than but adolescents. Families go camping and they all sleep in the same tent, you know, so yeah. they'll be close, close sleeping. Like, like a yurt, like a Mongolian yeah. girl, right? And um, I love, love that film, Babies. Have you seen that film, Babies? Beautiful. Yeah. It's so beautiful to see how everyone's co-sleeping and the feeding and that creativity again around, you know, making dummies out of fat with a matchstick. Like it's just mm. amazing what everyone's doing around the world. My to- daughter went, um, Sarah went travelling in Mongolia, quite a, had been another adventurer. And the custom there was to just yell out at the um, girl and they, their custom is to take in travellers. And so, oh, wow. you know, she would sleep with this whole family and she, she brought back a photo of a child, you know, or lots of photos, but one of them was a child. She said, guess how old this kid is? I said, I don't know, he looks about three. She said, the granddad with no teeth told me he was one and a half, but she said all I ever saw him eat was a big leg of sheep <laughs> and boob. <laughs> Love it. It's great. It's amazing. We actually grow on love, really. It doesn't really matter what else goes in otherwise sometimes. Um, so I think that's our sleep questions. But do you ever sort of help mums with their postnatal depletion? Um, we're big fans of um, Dr. Oscar Seralek, and he's going to join our podcast I've as well. Him. He's great. Yes. He's amazing. Yes. It makes perfect, perfect sense that yeah. you know, our bodies, we grow a baby, we feed a birth a baby, we feed a baby, and our babies get first dibs on that nutrition. And particularly yeah. things like your omega-3, you know, because breast milk's really rich in this, it's really important for the baby's brain development. And, um, you know, that, that mothers get this in their food, whether it's fish or whether it's flaxseed or whatever it is that they can. And, and I'm a big believer in the food before the supplements, you know, that you yeah. really need the food. And um, with our baby bickies, we've, I mean, obviously they have flaxseed in, but we've, we've got a new brekkie and we're, Food, we've complied with food labelling laws so we can actually say it's rich in omega-3. Awesome. So it's got good stuff in it for, you know, new mums to nourish those mothers. And I think it's, you know, if you can get it from food, yeah. and we neglect ourselves. You know, it's the old burnt chop syndrome, isn't it, that mothers yeah. are so busy looking after their children and their babies and their house and whatever other responsibilities they've got, whether they're going to work or whatever, that... They push it and we push our bodies too hard. Yeah, totally. So do you think it's, um, you know, when a woman is really, really depleted, what would you say, like, could she continue breastfeeding or should she wean? What's the, yeah, have you ever seen those sorts of scenarios? I have. And then I would refer that mother on to someone like Dr. Sarah Lack, you know, an integrative medicine specialist who would do that, um, who would help them get back up again because they can still continue to breastfeed. I mean, it's their body stores that are depleted. The baby's getting first dibs, so they need to, you know, up those body stores. But I have seen them, you know, really foggy brained and, you know, she's saying to her partner, can you take notes? Because she can't even follow a conversation. And And I always say to her mother, what did you eat for breakfast? What do you, you know, what did you have for lunch? What have you eaten today? Not just are you eating well. You know, it's always think about what you've actually eaten. And so often it might've been a piece of toast. It might've been a cup of coffee. Often it's not much and it's two o'clock in the afternoon and you think you, your body can't do this. Mm. You really need to, you know, do something. And, you know, if it's an, if the mother wants to wean, that's her prerogative. But if she can do something and also getting your iron levels and your thyroid levels checked because yeah. Iron and, and B12 too, but iron and thyroid in particular can have those symptoms of, you know, depression, anxiety. I have Graves disease, which is an autoimmune thyroid disease and disorder. And, you know, as that flares up, the anxiety is just revolting. Yeah, so totally. It's about taking care of yourself and, and getting those blood tests, you know, homework. I, when I've done seminars, you know, there might be 100 women in the room 
And I'll say, has anyone in this first year had their iron on thyroid levels checked? The most I've ever had is about five hands go up. Wow. And so it's not happening and it should be happening. Practitioners should be, you know, doctors, when you have a six week checkup, should be asking about this. Absolutely. And we should be having at least three blood tests throughout a pregnancy and then at least a six week checkup as well, blood test. And I'm, I'm as bad as anyone at the self care, but if we don't look after ourselves, how can we look after our families? That's just, we can't. We've got to no. stop. It's the old aeroplane with the oxygen mask on, isn't it? Yeah, it really, really is. And I've just literally had an iron infusion and I feel like for 17 years, I've never really got my iron levels back up. My ferritin stores have been really low and my hemoglobin's low. And I finally had an iron infusion after meeting Oscar. I kind of like was kind of, okay, I better get onto this. And my next step is, is my thyroid with a subclinical hyperthyroid, but it is, it's so common and we can fix these things. And that's why I'm sort of tracking my progress and sharing it on social media. And I can't believe the conversations that women are having about it and how much they're having to almost fight to get uh, their sort of iron infusions or support for that. Wow. Because there are, there, the iron infusions are a lot more common now mm. for women with newborns. Yeah. Uh, throughout love, it just seems to be a bit more of an awareness because there certainly wasn't that. My daughter's vegetarian and had a bleed when she had her baby. There was no iron infusion offered. And, and you know, they didn't even say, are you a vegetarian? Like her levels were just borderline. So she had to take iron. And if you're taking iron, your, your levels are only going to come up about one point a month. It's going to take a long time for you to get that energy back. Whereas with an infusion, in a couple of weeks, you're starting to feel good again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I'm on week, I'm at like two weeks now and I've just started to feel better. And it's so interesting when the body is taken care of, the mind works better and the emotions are more stable, just like you say. And yes. so, yeah, the, the feeling of overwhelm and depression, anxiety was certainly there for me. But um, as a, you know, forceful single mom entrepreneur, I just like push through, push through, push through. And I was like, sometimes, no, actually, I'm going to see what's going on in the body. And it's interesting. I feel so much more calm and I'm sleeping so much better. And yeah, it's Yes, we push sound. through one more day, one more day, one more day. And we don't see that gap to take care of ourselves. Yeah. So it's that's what we're going to say. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So what would your message be, final message be to all the young families out there? Be kind to yourself. You know, you have nothing to prove. You don't have to do a, a whole load of things. You don't have to have your children all beautifully dressed on Instagram. You don't have to have your house looking amazing all the time. You know, there's going to be mess. There's going to be tears. There's going to be your child is going to behave badly in public. There are going to be nights when you just think you cannot wake another time and really being kind to yourself and and doing doing you you know, whatever you need to do. Because I think if, if you just listen to your heart and listen to your baby and trust that connection between you, I don't think you're going to go very far wrong. Sounds perfect. I totally agree. Well, thank you for helping us surrender to the chaos and find the beauty and trust ourselves and all the great work that you do, Pinky. You're a legend. Thanks so much for sharing your words of wisdom with us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Okay, thanks, bye.